Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. We record these interviews so potential buyers have more information about the seller and the business to help them make a buying decision. Before we dive in, let's go over a brief summary of the business. It is an Amazon FBA business created in April of 2017 in the children niche. The average monthly revenue for the business is $44,113 and makes an average of $8,256 per month in net profit. The assets included in the sale are an Amazon Seller Central account with 24 SKUs, primary domain and all site content and files, secondary domain and all site content and files, supplier contracts and relationships, social media pages and accounts, which are Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. There are trademarks. There's an email list, which is in total of a little over 38,000 subscribers across two lists, two phone apps, which is iTunes and Google. And just as a disclaimer, inventory is not normally included in the list price, but further details can be provided to active buyers. And a second disclaimer, buyers should have an active VAT number in all UK and EU countries where this business has inventory stored before the transfer can finalize. It is highly recommended to begin the VAT registration process as soon soon as possible. So for everyone listening, you can visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace and search for listing 57933 to learn more about the business, or you can unlock this listing to start your due diligence if you're interested in purchasing this asset. So that's a brief overview of the business for sale. So let's hear from the seller with me today. So welcome to the show, Oksana. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Nick? I'm doing great. And I'm looking forward to learning more about you and your business. So to start us off, the first question is, can you tell us a little about your background in building and running online businesses? Well, I don't have a lot of background to this before the company that we started. And we actually started it by accident on one of the weekends. My daughter came to me and she was 10 years old at the time. She came to me on Saturday morning and said, why don't we start an online business, mom? And I thought (laughs) initially, (laughs) I paused initially because I wanted to say no, because at that time I had the contract and I was engaged full time by one of Fortune 500 companies. And as project manager, I was handling multiple complex projects. My days were long, lots of overtime. The payment was very good, and I wasn't looking for another project. But then I thought that could be a good thing for the family. I was really busy. I didn't have time for the family, for the kids. And I thought, what if I handle it as another project? It wasn't entirely uncommon for a project manager to get a new project, even if you're overlooked. And so my first reaction is always, you must be kidding me. But Mm. then when you think about it, then you just take it over and you make sure that this is a success. I like the idea. I like that we would spend time with the kids. So I had two girls, but back at the time, they were 10 and 7. We spent time together. I thought I'd teach them something new. So it was fun. The funny thing, though, is that when she came out with this idea, on the same weekend, we built up Shopify site with no experience, you know, the technology of these days. We installed Oberlo. So, you know, by the end of the weekend, we had the whole Shopify built for the products for dropshipping. And we kind of started taking sales. And so it was very exciting. But then in a couple of weeks, I started to be extremely uncomfortable. I felt like I was a fraud (laughs) because I thought, oh, my God, I don't really know. It's a dropshipping product, right? (laughs) I don't really know what's the quality. The shipping was taking extremely long. So we ended up refunding everything and the customers got free product. Wow. That's how we started. My daughter, though, 
she came up with the brand name and it's an awesome brand name. I still cannot believe that we got it. And we learned our lesson. Basically, we figured out that we're really good to work together. We're extremely efficient, productive. So we learned a lot. We spent some time digging around. I discovered Amazon FBA, fulfilled by Amazon program. I fell in love with the business model. And so we signed up. Our first discussion when my daughter came to me was actually in March of 2017. In May of the same year, we took our first sale on Amazon. And a year and a half later, we reached our first million mark. Wow. And then I quit my job and here we are. Wow. That's incredible. So your 10-year-old daughter at the time suggested that you start an online business. I didn't even know that 10-year-old knew about online business. Maybe I'm just so disconnected from that, but that's incredible. Oh my God, the kids are so developed these days. It was an incredible journey and I learned a lot from the kids. Wow. That's the first time I've ever heard that. (laughs) That's incredible. So I guess I can assume how you chose this niche given it's a project started with you and your daughter, but did you want to talk about why you chose this niche specifically? Sure. The answer is in the story, designing, producing, and launching kids' product was easy for us. Our family is very creative. So taking the product that everybody's talking about in school, adding a twist, a bundle, or turn it into a game was fairly easy for us. With time, we expanded into kids, family, board games, home decor, and personal safety categories. We have two brands now. One is our main brand that my daughter came up with from the beginning. And another one was inspired by COVID and family safety. It's a really cool name too. We just had a trademark PTO in November last year. So to summarize, we're focusing on the family and family needs. Our sweet spot is kids of age 8 and up to 20, and adults, of course. We wanted to make sure that from the brand's perspective, we don't limit the type of the products that we release, and we still maintain the cohesiveness of the brand. Our strong preference, though, is giftables, because these are the products that sell like hotcakes in your form. The cost of advertising is low because of high conversion, And it's just such a joy to be a part of somebody's holiday. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So you started this business a few years ago and now you're ready to sell it. So why are you selling the business instead of keeping it and growing it? It's a really good question. The thing is that we started this as a side project. We didn't think much of that, but then it turned into our family baby (laughs) The whole family looked after that, but now the family is five years old. In company years, that's a lot. And for me personally, the new products and games that I designed would always start with a spark and a strong desire to share it with kids. And it may sound cheesy, but that was the way of, you know, for our family to spread the love. And we always enjoyed this process when we get feedback and it's exciting and it's interesting for others. But the family priorities have changed. You know, the kids are now 14 and 17 and we have other interests. We're excited about nutrition. We're excited about well-being. We consider adding a couple of more nutrition related products to the brand but that would stretch and it would really stretch this from the branding perspective plus we could use the funds for the new business but the main reason actually is that we wanted to see that this brand grows and since the kids are they're not like the growing up so it became not as natural for us to be designing kids related products and it would be amazing if somebody who is interested in growing the brand would take it over because the brand itself like the two brands have a great foundation we planted a lot of seeds some of them are small trees but i'd love to see forest if somebody were to take it over and really invest the time Yeah, that's awesome that this business is so closely 
connected to, I guess, your daughters and now they are kind of grown out of the target audience. So yeah, I understand. Okay. So what is something that you learned from building this business that just seemed to work? Lots of things, actually. And, you know, if you think about, you know, looking back, I started this business with no marketing experience. I didn't have e com Like, I had nothing. I was a project manager. So for me, a lot of this was a self-discovery journey. I learned that designing, developing, and launching new products was easy for me. I'm good at finding an angle, a unique value proposition, I managed to differentiate from competitors and make organic ranking easier. It also helped with the hijackers on Amazon. Our games are fully designed in-house, and so it's hard for the competitors or hijackers to replicate our products. This really worked well for us. Nice. And was there anything that you tried with the business that didn't work out so well? Lots of things didn't work. learned so much and we tried so many things because as I said I didn't have a lot of experience so in lots of cases I was going by the book but that was somebody else's book I learned for example and also like me personally I learned that I'm not good at operations it's easier for me to create the new product than maintain the existing ones and so we have multiple products that we have successfully launched but we discontinued partially because we were always limited in funding. And so a new exciting thing would come about and we would just jump into it and, you know, run out of stock, discontinue. The good news, though, is that it was easy for us to create new. I also learned a very painful lesson, actually, that I must never treat my employees as family. At some point in the journey, we expanded and we had three employees. Then COVID started. We had some health-related issues, like family issues. And during the worst possible time, I got betrayed by the people that I trust. And I had to let them go. So that was painful. But I sort of learned that I really need to create boundaries and processes and, you know, treat the employees like employees. But, you know, the good news and from buyer's perspective that, In the last 12 months, I was running it alone. Our sales declined slightly, but it's not too bad considering that I don't have anybody helping me and I barely spent any time in the business. Nice. I know we chatted earlier before this recording, we chatted a little bit about your the Shopify side of things. So I did want to bring this up, even though we've been talking mostly about Amazon FBA. So for the Shopify side, where does the majority of that traffic come from? Yeah, we have the Shopify side. We don't drive traffic to it, but we have two apps. Actually, two apps in each iTunes and uh, Android. This is fitness apps. And so last year we had 31,000 visits in the year. And about a quarter of this comes from the app. The rest comes from random sources, some names, some referral sites but we don't drive any paid traffic to Shopify. Got it. Did you want to talk a little bit about what you do in terms of marketing? I know you just mentioned there are random sources of traffic, but yeah, how do you go about marketing these products? We spend the majority of everything. 100% comes from Amazon PPC. Our 2021 tacos, it's a funny name, at the total advertising cost of sales to revenue ratio was 12%. However, it ranged from 27 in July because we launched the new product. And actually, like I wanted to mention that the profit margin in June and July was fairly low because we launched our new products and we wanted to make sure that we're on the safe side. So we completely launched it 100% using PPC very aggressively. And in November and December, we dropped our PPC to 3 to 6%, which actually tells me that we're leaving some money on the table as we're not getting enough traffic. The product that we launched in summer, though, is producing sales organically with no PPC at all. Okay, great. So let's go into opportunities a little bit with this business. If you were to keep the business, what are some ways that you would try to grow it? 
lots of ideas. If I only had the time, the first one, I would probably sign the contract with the company who offered to pre-purchase one of the games in bulk with the exclusive right to sell in the U.S. stores other than Amazon. They approached me in October last year, and we actually considered signing. And like I was almost doing that, but then I pulled back as I don't know how this would affect the sale of the company. We only focus on Amazon, so expanding to other stores would mean the increase in sales, but I just didn't want to sign the exclusivity contract. I'm not sure what's the marketing strategy of the buyers. They might be interested in non-Amazon, so I pulled back. But to me, awesome source of passive income because they pre-purchase. The second one, I would consider licensing out the games. They're fully designed in-house. I'm just not familiar with the way to monetize that, but I know there should be a way to license them out. And this is another source of passive income. So the third one that I've been thinking of is just if I had an additional source of funding and actually, you know, selling the company is a big, you know, self-discovery company discovery thing. Like I had to dig through a lot of things and I realized that I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. One of them is that we have all those discontinued products that we just like, we launched it. Like an example to that is just two years ago in Q4, we sold $180,000 worth of a product. We made 50,000 in profit, but then we never reordered. We have a couple of products like that that have reviews. If you think about Amazon, this is the biggest asset that you can have on Amazon. This is the reviews. And we would just jump into the next one, leaving hundreds of reviews unexplored. So looking back now that I'm going through the paperwork, I was like, oh, my God, why did we even do that? <laughs> we, were, we were always limited in funding and, you know, launching new was so much fun. But that would be a really good area of opportunity. So the last product that we just released has, like, we're not running PPC to that. And again, like, in preparation for this interview, I looked at it, I was like, oh, my God, we were just only right, you know, spending 3% of our sales on PPC, which suggests that we're just leaving money on the table. Like, the new product is running completely organically, so no PPC at all. So we're just like, it, that would be a better source of sales. Another thing, too. We had to like shrink our stock in a way because of COVID, because Amazon introduced those storage limitations. We had to engage 3PL and it's fairly expensive. Like it ends up at about 2% of our, you know, overall cost. I would reduce it or completely eliminate because now Amazon started expanding the storage again. So we have a lot of unused room. And I would also use Amazon Global Logistics because they're way cheaper and they reduce the time and cost. So that would be another area, another opportunity. And the last two last ones. One of them is that I would consider an external source of traffic, Facebook and Google. And I wasn't good at that. I have no experience with that. But for somebody who has the experience, we have... 48,000 customer contacts, like it's customers that bought from us, that would make a great audience, you know, for customer segmentation. It's just like, I could never figure out how to do that. And the last one is the stock availability. We're really not good at this. We have like a storefront in the US, Canada, and UK. UK is out of the stock the majority of the time. And mm-hmm. like, it just, there is a lot of room for improvement, that's for sure. Got it. Well, it certainly seems like there's tons of opportunity for growth here. So I guess it seems like there are a lot of things that can be done. Let's go to the work required. If somebody wanted to purchase this and just keep the business as is, can you describe the amount and the type of work that you do on this business for maintenance? And if you could talk about some of the skills that a new owner would need in order to be successful with this? Of course. So I'm glad you mentioned maintenance because, of course, while you're in design and launch, it takes a lot more time. But luckily, it can be managed in spurts. But in terms of maintenance, the last 12 months is actually a good example because I barely spent any time. 
and I have no employees. Our PPC set of keywords is mature for the older products and the new products are running organically. We used to provide a lot of customer support for one of our older electronic products, but we sunsetted this year. So now I'm down to an hour or two maximum and not even every week. I only keep an eye on the stock and I place transfer orders from 3PL whenever required. I have to mention something super quickly. Sheepdog is amazing. Uh, They have the most amazing dashboard. Their processes are so well designed. It just really takes a click of a button and the transfers are smooth. They work great. So that really, you know, reduces my load. And this is a 3PL? 3PL, yeah. They might be a little more expensive. I didn't have time to look around when I signed up because we had to do it fast. But now that I am so in on their processes that I don't even look around because it's all worth it. Nice. What was the name of that ship? Bod? Ship Bod. Cool. All right. Well, that's great. So what I'm hearing then is inventory management for maintenance, which is a very common thing for a physical product owner to have to deal with. Any skills that you think a new owner would need in order to be successful with this? It seems like you have a good relationship with the 3PL right now and they handle a lot of things. Yeah, anything that you wanted to mention about that? Any skills? Well, from maintenance perspective, as you hear, it's not a big deal. Like you need some basic organizational skills, maybe some planning, estimation. So Excel spreadsheet always helps just to plan the stock. Of course, if the expectation is that the brand will grow, which I hope this is the case, then of course, you need to understand how Amazon works and especially all the policies so that sometimes it's a silly mistake because you just don't know the policy. So I would definitely take a course and make sure that I know what's going on. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think that's talked about enough, which is just understanding the terms of service that Amazon has, which a lot of experienced sellers learn that sometimes through painful experiences. But yeah, just knowing up front, I think is important. So we talked about opportunities for growth earlier. Now let's talk a little bit about the risks. What do you think are the biggest risks with this business that a buyer should be aware of? I think on Amazon... There are two major risks. One is the risk of hijackers. It's very painful creating a listing and putting so much into pictures and images and taking and seeing that somebody else took it over and actually taking uh, sales, especially if on top of that, you're driving traffic to that through PPC. So luckily, this is something that we've done to defend ourselves. All of our products are very IP heavy. So we invest a lot into making sure, like if it's a game, it's a completely good game that we built in house from scratch. If it's other products that there is a twist or something that makes it very defensible. The second one is, and I have to mention this, there is always the risk of Amazon suspension for a listing, or they would require some new documentation. We've been on Amazon for almost five years, so the risk is fairly low, I think, but I still think the risk is there. And actually, it is very healthy to be slightly paranoid when it comes to Amazon, because that actually what helps you to stay on the safe side when it comes to Amazon and follow the processes and follow the policies so that you don't get the prices down the road. Yep. Those are both good points. And both of those are things that really any Amazon seller has to face, hijackers and just being on the good side of Amazon when it comes to their terms of service. Okay. So some last questions here. Putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why do you think this is a business worth buying? Well, both brands have a great potential. And together, they may include a wide range of kids, family, and personal safety products that are always in great demand. The best asset on Amazon is reviews. And we have over 5,000, a lot more if I count the products that we discontinued. Unfortunately, though, the count is not in the best shape. We've seen better times, that's for sure. 
we're out of stock for some products, we discontinued others, and the marketing is underpaid. And that's the beauty of the deal, actually. It's like buying a house that's lacking a fresh coat of paint in a very good location. Isn't it what they say? Location, location, location. <laughs> and of course, an Amazon location in real estate is actually reviews, and we have a lot of them. So I think these two brands, and I have to mention the second one because it's a baby brand. I think it's a good deal for somebody who, whether you're taking it over as a maintenance, as a source of passive income, it's a fairly protected brand that you can leave it the way it is. Or even better for somebody who can realize and leverage the potential to grow. And as I said, there's so many seeds that we planted that we either didn't have the skills or the funding to actually see it grow. And I'd love to see the forest. Excellent. Okay, some last housekeeping questions for you. So first one is, how much support are you willing to offer buyers? I think we listed with a standard 30 days and two Skype calls, but really don't mind helping more if required. Okay. Perfect. And would you commit to a non-compete? I love building products, designing products for kids. And so if I were asked not to produce anything for kids, I'd probably say no and I would give the business. But if we can negotiate something that works for the buyer, protects from non-compete perspective, I'm happy to do so. But I really hope that we can stay within the area that works for both of us because it's mostly nutrition now that I'm interested in, but there could be some things that we can negotiate. Okay, sounds good. And are you open to something like an earnout? Sure. I mean, I'd love a clean exit, of course, because that helps, you know, to concentrate other opportunities that I'm running with and I run with so many. But then at the same time, if, you know, funding is a question, if it's really want to see somebody take it over that can grow this business. And so if we see that there is a good person who is really good fit for the company, we can definitely discuss it. Perfect. And last question, is there anything you'd like to add that you think I might have missed during the interview? No, just wanted to say thank you for your time, Nick, and wanted to say thank you to Empire Flippers. The whole experience was outstanding so far, and I'm looking forward to the next chapter and next steps. I wanted to thank the listeners for listening, and thank you to the people that are considering buying the business and raising my baby brands. <laughs> oh. Thank you for your time. Well, I think on that note, that's the perfect place to wrap this up. So yeah, thank you, Oksana. And thank you for just sharing your story. And yeah, just joining us on today's episode. And I do hope that your business is purchased in the near future and by the right buyer. Thank you so much, Nick. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this listing has already been sold, head over to empireflippers.com slash marketplace and search for listing number 57933. And if you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. And once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So until next time, enjoy your digital journey.